Hello and welcome to our presentation on XGBoost for the Virtual Data Science Seminar. My name is Matthew Evans and I'm from EMC Actuarial and Analytics and this is my colleague. Hi, I'm Callum from Atzer itself. And um, today we're going to be talking about applying the XGBoost champion regression algorithm to an insurance problem. We don't have permission from um, AXA to use their data or indeed to reproduce precisely what they're doing internally. Uh, but what we are going to do today is show you how you can apply XGBoost using a generated data set. This generated data set resembles a typical insurance uh, loss data set. So we think it's um, so we think it's realistic. We're also going to be comparing XGBoost to other commonly used approaches in insurance. GLMs and GAMs, and we're going to be commenting on the um, on the results. XGBoost is a regression and classification algorithm which is based on trees, cards, classification and regression trees. This is a very simple um, approach. Uh, a, a classification regression tree simply divides up your data set based on a factor, and then it checks how um, how much the two halves differ, and it um, changes the way it divides your data set to try and maximise the difference between the two, the two parts. Once the tree has done it once, it does it again and again and again, each time trying to make each divided section as homogenous as possible and as different from the other, from the other section to improve predictiveness. Um, the trouble is with a simple tree is that actually in practice they're they're not, they're not so effective, um, even though the way they divide the data, we think they should be good at capturing nonlinear effects. We think they should be good at capturing interactions, um, but it turns out that in practice, simple trees don't work very well. Um, much work in machine learning is focused on improving and augmenting um, a simple um, uh, cart. Uh, one of the first, one of the earlier rather, um, improvements was the random forest. Um, XGBoost is a descendant um, of um, the random forest in the sense that it's a much more recent uh, improvement on the simple tree approach. The way XGBoost works is by having a collection of trees, an ensemble of trees, so many, many, many trees, each um, fitting to the data in a different way. Um, and these, these trees are combined together and the weights applied to each tree are um, altered to, um, to maximize and optimize the fit of the model to the data. Um, XGBoost is open source. We've, um, we've been running it in R. You can also run it in Python. For this demonstration, we're going to generate insurance like loss data using a Poisson frequency and a gamma severity approach. Combining these models will give us a total loss cost to which we're going to model. For the purposes of our demonstration, we're going to keep the Poisson parameter fixed, in our case at 1.2, to keep things a little bit more simple. And it is the gamma severity that we are going to vary according to input data that we have defined. We have created four variables that will feed into our gamma model. Three of these are categorical, with uh, relativities assigned to each possible value that uh, each categorical variable can take. And we also have a nonlinear response curve attached to our numerical variable. We have also modeled in an interaction to make things a bit more interesting and to make our data set more like real life. These relativities are multiplied together and are fed into the gamma model in its shape parameter uh, for each row of data. Combining the Poisson frequency and the gamma severity will give us a Tweedy distribution. So in our example, we're going to be creating Tweedy models. So here on this slide just shows a brief breakdown of the categorical variables that we have created and the relativities attaching to each one. So for example, our first variable, cat1, can take two values, a and b, and they have assigned relativities of 1 and 5. Um, please note that for cat3, our, th our third variable, uh, although it can take three values, the relativities assigned to each of them are the same, b and 1. We have also decided to add an interaction term to test model efficacy. Um, in our case, the interaction is between uh, cat2 taking the value of 2 
and chat 3 taking the value of z and the interaction term is 1.7. This will see how our models can react to real life examples where interactions exist. In addition to the interaction term you saw on the previous slide, we've also introduced into our data a non-linear term. We've done this because uh, real life data is full of non-linear um, effects and we think it's quite an important thing, at times quite a difficult thing for models to pick up. We've designed this non-linear term so that it looks a little bit like the um, age curve in personal lines motor pricing, where young drivers see a material load over the average and also old drivers do as well. And we'll see how well our models fit to this, uh, this feature later. Now that we have defined our categorical and numerical variables that will be fed into our model, it is time to use these to generate the data. In our example, we are going to be generating 100,000 rows of data, and we do this by randomly sampling each variable 100,000 times. We also simulate the frequency 100,000 times using our Proson with fixed parameter of 1.2. The relativities attaching to each of our categorical and numerical variables are multiplied together, and then they are fed into the gamma model as its shape parameter. The gamma model is then simulated um, as many times as denoted by the frequency the, in each of these gamma runs are then added together in the row to get the loss cost for that uh, data row. This produces a Tweedy set, which we will now model to. Final thing to note is that we have split this data into a train and a test sample. The test sample is an outer sample set that we don't train the model on. This allows us to see how the model reacts to unseen data and helps us protect against overfitting. So in order to get XGBoost to work, we need to convert our data into what's called a sparse matrix. Um, this is because XGBoost doesn't understand categorical variables. It can only understand numbers. So all the inputs need to be numbers. So what we do is we convert each level of each categorical factor into a new column. So we can see here with cat 1a and cat 1b, they become columns in their own right and have a one or a zero representing the, um, the level of that particular factor. We repeat the same thing for cat 2 and cat 3. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, numerical variable num4 is unaffected. It can go in as is into the uh, sparse matrix. Um, one thing to mention about this is that if we have categorical variables that we treat in this way, the model doesn't actually know that cat 1a and cat 1b are two factor levels in the same factor. So we're actually taking information away from the model and probably lowering its efficacy. Um, a better thing to do, if it's possible and if it's appropriate for the factor, is to order those factor levels. So a categorical factor like that might be something like the riskiness of the car, say. So in those instances, or the riskiness of the postcode, in those in instances, we can put that uh, number into one column. And XGBoost will use it, and it will split the trees underneath X XGBoost, will split the data set properly from high to low. That should improve the, um, the model. Um, finally, you'll notice that on this data set, there is no response variable. We don't have the loss cost going in here. We just have the predictive variables. XGBoost takes those in separately. So now that we have created our sparse data set, the final step before we're ready to model is to turn it into an XGBoost data matrix. Fortunately, this is quite an easy step. It just revolves a wrapper function. And please see our code for more details on how to do this. Now that we have our data matrix all ready, uh, it's time to model. So um, here we have the XGB train. This is the modeling function. And you'll see that we're putting our train data set in. So we're still holding back our test data set to evaluate how well the model is fitting to unseen data. Um, I've put in a naive set of parameters um, just as a starting off point. To explain a little bit more about the parameters, so n rounds uh, determines how many trees XGBoost creates, and max depth denotes how deep these trees go, i.e. how many branches are created. A quick note about max depth is that increasing the depth allows at the model to view interactions or gives it a better chance to view interactions. However, a higher max depth 
also increases complexity to the model. So a, a balance definitely has to be struck here. Eta is defined as the learning rate, so how far down the gradient um, of the error function do we go on each step? A smaller eta means a smaller uh, reduction in error is taken at every step. So if you choose a smaller eta, then you need to compensate by choosing a high number of rounds. Eta is usually tuned near the end of the modeling process to fine tune the model to get the final uh, little bit of accuracy we can get from the model. Gamma is added to um, prevent against overfitting. Zero is the default value, so we aren't taking any special approaches to protect against overfitting. Carl sample by tree and subsample determine how much data is randomly selected at different stages. And Ming Chao weight uh, determines how much of a difference XG boost must see uh, between two uh, splits of data to think that a split is worthwhile. Since we are modeling a Tweedy, we have set the objective to Tweedy, and we have chosen um, a Tweedy variance power of 1.75. This was through a trial by error process uh, before the modeling was done. The final great thing about HGBoost that we've put into our first run model is the implementation of a watch list. A watch list um, allows us to view the error in the train set, but also the test set at each step of the modeling process. So you, you will see the modeling um, error, the modeling error in the train set go down, and you'll be able to evaluate how this affects the test set, the segment of the data that the model hasn't seen before. Matt will explain more about this uh, later. So a quick reminder on the Tweedy distribution. This is commonly used in uh, insurance applications uh, because it models a combination of Poisson for frequency and gamma for severity. Um, so quite often it's fitted to um, combined loss data sets where all the losses for a year for a particular risk are added together. Um, it has a parameter. The parameters we use for insurance are generally between one and two. And um, it gives us these different graph shapes depending on the parameter we input. For a low value of, of um, T here, we see that many, many risks run clean. So there's a big spike at zero. Um, where we do have claims, we see a nice little mini gamma uh, distribution emerging. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, where we have a higher frequency uh, Poisson in effect, we see many, many more claims. The relative spike at zero is a lot smaller. And because the frequency is higher, the, um, the, uh, we see the, the, the Poisson effect interfering more, making itself felt more over the total uh, distribution. With our um, watch list functionality enabled in our XG Boost fit, what we can do is compare the fit to our training data set to the fit to our test data set an external data set that the, um, that the model hasn't seen uh, as the number of uh, trees is increased, so as the fit is in, is in progress. And what this lets us do is identify the point at which XGBoost starts to overfit to its training set. It does this because it will carry on forever if, if we tell it to. It will carry on dutifully improving the fit um, by minimizing the, um, the error um, but the trouble is, as it does this, it becomes less predictive on data it hasn't seen before. And our test set, in this instance, is the data it hasn't seen before. So as the fit progresses, we see that the error on both data sets decreases and decreases and decreases. Um, and this is as, um, as XGBoost improves its fit on the training set. XGBoost will continue to improve its fit on the training uh, data set, going down this, this line here. But beyond this optimal point, we notice that the error on the test data set actually starts to increase. So we say that beyond this point, XGBoost has started to overfit to the training data set. It's very good at predicting the training data set, but it, it becomes steadily worse at predicting um, data it hasn't seen before. So in our future tuning for this XGBoost model, we're going to try to optimize, we're going to try and choose the number of iterations somewhere around this optimal, optimal part. 
One of the disadvantages of uh, XG Boost over other models traditionally used in insurance is that uh, the model is not so easily interpreted. We can't go to uh, underwriting colleagues and present a set of relativities as we could do with, um, with GLMs. Um, so instead, we've got to use other approaches for explaining, explaining and interrogating our model. What XG Boost does give you quite happily is a, uh, is a measure of factor importance. It does this by counting the number of times a particular factor is used by the tree to determine one of its um, splits, one of its branches. And we can see here happily that the model has picked up the major effects that we put into the model. First of all, the, um, the, uh, the relativity, one, the relativities one and five, the big difference between factor levels A and B for cat one. The next one it's picked up is the um, non-linear effect. So this is our, our age-like curve that we put in. That's num four, so that's being that's being used quite a lot. It's going to need to have um, one branch for each separate section of the curve it divides up. Cat two one was our other um, major effect. It's 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 uh, the middle the middle uh, factor level there, and happily our interaction term has been picked up here. So that's cat three z and cat two two. We can see. Um, Coming through, coming through here, and there's a there's a there's a, um, a, a kind of mix of further factors that the model is using to um, to improve to improve its fit. So we can see which ones are important. Uh, unfortunately, we can't say where interactions are. We can't say where relationships are nonlinear. This output is just a pretty crude measure. We can go and do separate investigations. Um, but it limits what we can um, what we can share with our underwriting business colleagues straight away. We need to do further um, further checks. So now that we've had the opportunity to inspect our first attempt at an XG boost model, we can definitely conclude that there's opportunity to improve the parameters. As Matt showed, there was substantial overfitting, so we could immediately see that the number of rounds we used should be reduced. But also uh, the other parameters we selected could be improved too. Thankfully, in R, there is this package called Carrot, which supplements the XG Boost package, which allows us to make this process of tuning, i.e. improving our parameters, much more efficient and streamlined. Carrot helps in two ways. The first is through cross-fold validation. Cross-fold validation automates and improves the process of uh, splitting up our data into test and train. So in our case, we're doing a five-fold um, cross-fold validation method. So here we have method equal to EV, which is cross-fold validation, and we're doing five folds. So in this case, um, Carrot will pick 20% of the data to be the holdout sample and train on the remaining 80%. Once it's fitted the model, it will then rotate that, uh, that test set round, so it will select a different 20% to be the test set and then run the model again. It will do this process five times, so that everything in our data set is in the test set, uh, test set once. This produces a much more robust uh, checking process, and um, the model produced after this cross validation should be even more accurate. Carrot can also help our tuning process through a grid search. So a grid search is where we specify multiple different options for each parameter, and then Carrot will run through each possible combination, run the model, and then once it's done, these uh, multiple model runs, it will tell us which parameters reduced the error by the most. Uh, this takes out a lot of the manual process of running the model, then manually changing one of the, pr the parameters, and then running the model again. Um, if you'd like to try multiple uh, parameters, multiple combinations of parameters, there is something called uh, random grid search, where Carrot will randomly select the parameters. This is good because it allows you to inspect a lar far larger range of parameters and as a result, you don't get caught up in local minima or maxima or telling the model to look somewhere, for example, uh, too high a depth where the reality is the best fit is actually far away from what you believe the parameter should be. So by, by being able to test as many parameters as possible, uh, you can be sure that your model is tuned as best as it can be. So we'll come back to uh, the XG Boost results later. 
but in the meantime, we're going to look at uh, results from traditional insurance uh, approaches. Um, first of all, the GLM. And um, this is our naive GLM with only simple factors in the model, no interaction, uh, and no special treatment of the, um, the non-linear numerical term. Uh, this is going to be our base model um, against, um, against which we, uh, measure, we measure improvements. We can see our root mean squared error here. And over the next model runs, we'll see, um, we'll see how we can improve on that. So in the next step for our GLM, uh, we are going to add in the interaction. Here in the codes, you can see where we've added in the, the interaction with cat2 times cat3. We need to add in this interaction because that's how we design the data with the relativity um, between cat2 and cat3. However, in real life situations, it may not be as easy to know exactly where interactions lie. Um, and it can take quite a lot of work to find where they are, particularly for new data sets. As hoped, adding in this interaction, adding more information into our GLM has reduced the root mean square error. However, um, as said before, we are still not uh, fully accounting for the numerical variable with its nonlinear response curve. So we are going to tackle this in the next step. So in this, um, in this GLM, we, uh, we keep in the interaction which we introduced previously. And to help deal with the nonlinear effect in num4, we have banded this variable. We've banded it and we've turned it into a categorical variable. Here it is here. This means that um, rather than trying to fit a straight line to, to, a, um, to a polynomial, the GLM is going to, um, to, uh, to fit uh, individual loads to different banded sections of that, um, of that line. So hopefully we should get a, um, a slightly better um, uh, result. And indeed, we do see that um, we uh, improve, improve the uh, root mean squared error over the previous run. So in, on the previous slide, when we uh, banded our numerical variable, we actually lost a little bit of information there. We increased our number of de degrees of freedom. And so there's still a little bit of room to reduce our root mean square error. The way to do this is to add in a polynomial term. You can see in the codes where we've done it here with our poly um, of order number two. We know to make uh, it sort of order two because the response curve was a quadratic polynomial. And now we found that we've put in the best information we possibly can into our GLM. It's almost with perfect information. As hoped, our root mean square error has decreased further uh, due to the improvements we've made to our model. Most Emblem and SAS users will be aware of splines, which are polynomials tied together um, at their boundary conditions. Um, you can certainly add these splines into GLMs, but because we knew that our response curve was a simple quadratic, we didn't need to do that. So we just added a section of a spline. So for our final traditional approach model, we introduce a GAM. This is a, um, an, a, an extension of the GLM uh, framework. Uh, it allows additional um, structure in the model formula. Um, I think it works really well for uh, real life problems because it, um, it lets you deal with nonlinear effects without quite as much work as under the GLM framework. So previously where we put in a polynomial or where we might put in a spline, um, the GAM structure lets us put in a smoothed spline straight away. And um, it does the interaction just as before as well. And we can see that that without having to know what that nonlinear um, effect looks like, we actually managed to beat the GLM with perfect information. So, um, so we think this is a really uh, powerful approach in uh, real life problems. So finally, to wrap up, um, we can see how we started up here with our naive um, GLM, not making proper allowance for the interaction or the nonlinear term. Um, the interaction helped a bit. Dealing with the nonlinear term helped quite a lot. And this, this level here is, um, is uh, I, I think, is, is, is broadly representative of, of uh, where practitioners are a lot of the time. 
Um, the polynomial, so proper treatment of that nonlinear term without the banding gives us a, a further marginal improvement. The GAM significantly gets us all the way there with less work, I think, and less uh, risk in the modeling process. And um, the same could possibly be said of our uh, XG boost uh, application as well. So the, uh, with, the, with the, simple, the simple model gets us quite close. And actually when we use grid search, it gets us very close to the, um, to the top, the perfect information GLM result. So, um, so we think this is a, we think this is a, um, a useful approach. It's certainly got um, applications despite its limitations. So uh, we think there's a, um, there's a niche there for this tool. Uh, one final thing to mention is that uh, we're assessing model uh, goodness of fit here with root mean squared error. Um, root mean squared error is kind of convenient to use. It's very easy for us to put it in here, but it's not strictly what we should be doing for um, a skewed Tweedy distribution. We should have used a, um, uh, the model deviance specific to, um, to Tweedy, and we've, um, we've put that aside for some uh, future work for us. But, but happily, the, uh, the narrative here stacks up with um, root mean squared. Okay, to wrap up then, um, we've seen and we've shown that XGBoost can be a really effective tool. Um, it's quite easy to demonstrate XGBoost outperforming traditional approaches, uh, but it does have disadvantages. It is a black box. It's mostly about a black box at any rate. Um, it takes a lot more work to interrogate the model and to explain the model to colleagues in underwriting. We can certainly do things. We can we can look at uh, feature importance output, and we can do lots of testing on individual risks and cohorts of risks and stuff like that. But there's a lot more work uh, to be done there in communicating the, um, the models. Um, also, other limitations that people come up against is that um, uh, it's difficult to, um, to apply XGBoost in a production environment. Lots of legacy insurance systems, especially in personal lines, will demand a simple multiplicative or additive structure. It's not so easy to deploy something like this. It can be done, and people are doing it. It just takes a, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more work. Um, finally, in mitigations, we saw how uh, the GAM smoother did the work of a polynomial spline earlier, very easily without us having to, to know much about that relationship. It picked up that relationship and it performed as well as the GLM. And, uh, and I think actually that XGBoost and other approaches uh, do similar things across the whole, the whole um, the model. Um, so even though it's harder to uh, justify and explain the output, there are instances where using a tool like XGBoost might actually lead to less risk in your modeling process. There's less chance of things going wrong. It's relatively simple to, um, to apply. So you can imagine there are, there are environments where it might be advantageous to use that, um, that approach. Maybe if you're not heavily resourced, or maybe if there's not loads of data, or maybe something needs to, be, needs to be quick, or maybe for some reason that um, actually the precise output is going to be moderated or checked by hand or something like that. So you can imagine situations where it's um, advantageous. So following our presentation, our code will be available online on GitHub. So if you have the time, please feel free to download the code, have a play around with it yourself in R, and see what you can get. Um, of particular interest to us is this root mean square error. So if you have the opportunity to apply a Tweedy deviance, which may be more appropriate, uh, please let us know the results that you find. So finally, I'd like to add that there is so much literature about XGBoost online, particularly on Kaggle, which is a machine learning uh, website where the top data scientists compete to win uh, cash prizes in real life problems. You'll find that a lot of the winning models involve XGBoost in a big way. So there's been a lot of research into how to fi fine tune the final 0.1% uh, of accuracy out of your model. A couple of um, common or popular examples that the top data scientists use are model ensembling. 
So combining the results of your XG boost with another model and averaging the results or taking a weighted average of the results to reduce the error slightly. And another example is stacking. So continuously applying your XG boost model to reduce the error and improve your accuracy. But please note that although um, these structures do exist, these uh, ways of reducing error do exist, they, these are for the final percentage points to win you the competition. So you may find that going that extra mile just to reduce the error by 0.001% may not be worth it in a real life um, application. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of our presentation. So it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.